Hi everyone, uh, so my name's Tom, uh, my pronouns are he, him, and uh, I have the very pleasure of hosting this panel discussion uh, slash Q&A session on uh, providing equitable healthcare and uh, experiences for LGBTQ plus people and patients and staff and everyone really. Um, hosted by uh, LGBT Medics and uh, Staff Pride Network and the BioCorta and some other wonderful folk. So we've got a few folk joining us. Um, so I'm going to get everyone to um, introduce themselves from the panel. And um, essentially what we're going to do is go around a set of questions that uh, folk have submitted already. So we're going to kind of discuss different themes and different topics based on things that people have already asked. Um, uh, and then um, we can then open open to kind of Q and A type questions from um, questions submitted during the session. So let's make a little bit of a start. We'll start with some introductions, um, just whilst uh, hopefully whilst others are joining, and then yeah, we'll get cracking. So do the rest of the panel want to introduce themselves? Um, so we'll start with um, Laura. Do you want to start? Seeing as your camera's turned on first. Yeah. Hi everyone. My name's Laura. Uh, my pronouns are she/her. And I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Edinburgh, um, but I'm also the well-med LGBT liberation officer and former president of LGBT Medics. Excellent. Thanks, Laura. And Ben, your camera went on second, so you can introduce yourself next. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Ben. I'm a junior doctor working in Edinburgh at the moment. Um, and I have a particular interest in medical education and particularly equality and diversity training within undergraduate and postgraduate medical education. I'm also a committee member on GLAD, which is the Association of LGBTQ Doctors and Dentists in the UK. Uh, grand. And uh, Lorraine, do you want to come in next? Hi, yeah. um, my name's Lorraine. I am a nurse and a yoga teacher. Until very recently, I was a clinical skills facilitator at um, the Edinburgh Medical School. Um, I recently left that job to run Edinburgh Community Yoga, which is a yoga not for profit. Um, we run LGBT yoga classes as part of that organisation and I supported a group of students to set up the LGBT medics group probably five years ago now. Um, so really interested to be here with you all and share this discussion. Excellent, thank you very much for joining. And then Dabby, do you want to uh, come and introduce yourself as well? Hi, um, my name is Debbie Aitken. Um, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm a senior lecturer in medical education and I'm also the director of the clinical educator program, um, also known as the KEP. Um, as a senior uh, member of academic staff at Edinburgh Medical School, I'm part of the MBCHB Equality and Diversity in the Curriculum group. And I'm also part of um, the subgroup that was formed specifically to look at further opportunities for enhancing LGBT plus content in the wider curriculum. Um, and as director of the KEP, um, I set up a workshop a few years ago entitled Supporting LGBT plus Learners, uh, which was developed and delivered by Tom, um, who's also a member of KEP faculty, as he may have already said. <laughs> And this workshop is basically to support educators in understanding why and how they might sensibly and appropriately incorporate LGBT plus issues into their medical teaching, but also to kind of help support educators um, with supporting LGBT medical students. Grand. Thanks, Debbie. So, uh, yeah, um, a lovely range of folk on the panel. Um, I forgot to say what my background was. Uh, I, um, work for MED, the Education Directorate in Lothian, and uh, work clinically in uh, PEDS A&E. Um, and my interests are, uh, from an education point of view, are kind of healthcare inequalities and um, social determinants of health uh, and things like that. So hopefully we should be able to, between us, chat about uh, quite a few of these questions that have been submitted already. So I'm going to kind of uh, essentially go through what's been asked um, and submitted by, by um, folk already um, and hopefully we'll cover a, a reasonably broad range of uh, range of things um, which are all essentially um, you know need to know stuff and, and 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 things that we can all do and all get involved in uh, as well as some more specific um, uh, direct questions as well um, and then if there's anything that we don't end up covering then um, 
Behind the scenes, we have uh, Jen and Jen, uh, who can see if there's any other questions that are submitted and, and we can, can go from there. So I've kind of grouped them into themes. Um, so we're going to start off with, uh, well, we'll start off with the big one. So um, the first kind of main question that was submitted is, how can the structural and institutional factors that contribute to health inequality and inequity for LGBTQ plus people begin to be addressed? Well, um, I think begin is really the right word um, because overall, we're not very good at this and overall most places are very good at this and do you know what as a panel we don't have all the answers and we don't represent everyone um that is uh, a stakeholder in this but i think between us we might have some uh some idea of where to start and where to begin um as some of the panelists have already said you know everyone um has got some different hats on um you know debbie's working for the university in trying to set up all of these programs and has already you know set up a lot of these programs that try and address things from a um, curriculum level and an undergraduate level and often a behind the scenes level that we don't necessarily always know about but there's stuff happening um, and you know Ben has said about being a, um, a committee member of GLAD um, and uh, you know there's a lot of work that goes on there and, and uh, during the course of this discussion I'm sure it'll be really interesting to hear about some of the stuff that's happening. Um, so does uh, Debbie, do you want to come in and sort of talk about a little bit about um, the kind of what's happening with the university and really, you know, I'm a big believer that from a structural point of view and from a kind of addressing wide scale things, it's all about education, isn't it? It's all about actually, unless we know the things that create inequalities and if we know the things that, that create barriers to inequitable or barriers to equitable healthcare, um, you know, we can't, we can't begin to address it. Um, so I think, firstly, because I think a lot of the people joining uh, and watching this are um, uh, students themselves, so it'd be really cool just to hear a little bit about what's been happening and um, what the university kind of has at the moment. Sure. Um, so we um, used to have a half day session for first years um, on LGBT plus issues. Um, and it was often commented by medical students that they didn't feel that that was enough. And I would completely agree with that. So there's been a lot of work being done recently um, to try and make sure that LGBT issues are not just dealt with in a half day, but is kind of integrated into the curriculum in a more meaningful way. Um, and um, basically what's been done in year one and year two is that there's two modules um, in particular, one called Understanding Experiences of Illness and the second one, um, Health and Communities. And in both of those modules, we've been taking an intersectional approach to understanding health and illness um, at the individual patient and community level, which I think is, is the right approach. I think it's, you know, we, we can't deal with LGBT issues in isolation. Um, we have also had a specific week on social determinants in which we sort of unpacked meanings and terminology, which is important for people to be able to understand. It's not the only thing. I think there's often um, um, people have this idea that if they understand the terminology, then that's they've done the work that they need to do. Um, so um, we tried to sort of unpack some of the, these meanings and terminology um, the students did a privilege exercise, um, which included statements um, relating to gender and sexuality. Um, so that's for the first year um, of the MBCHB. Um, moving into the second year, um, we're still working on this, but trying to sort of integrate uh, more LGBT plus content into the various modules. Um, and one of them being the changing profession. So kind of understanding a bit more about like, you know, LGBT issues within the actual medical profession um, and also looking at examples of activism um, in one of the units it's called social responsibility. Um, as we move into the clinical years of the MBCHB, the hope is that we'll be able to um, soon start to be able to um, offer medical students um, some active bystander intervention training, 
which my hope is that it will be done in conjunction with staff so that yeah. students and staff can work together um, to um, basically have a better understanding of how to deal with situations in clinical areas. That's really interesting and, and, and it's it is really nice to see that positive steps are being made by the university because I think you know the the feeling is overall and this is not particular to Edinburgh this is this is applicable to pretty much anywhere but certainly uh, certainly across Scotland that the curriculum content uh, relating to actually relating to any kind of healthcare inequalities uh, and inequity uh, but particularly for LGBT people is, is very lacking one of the students um, recently did a, a dissertation all about it and found that yeah pretty much everything was lacking so actually the fact that this is being brought in and that across the years not just you know as you say half an hour as a one-off that it's being brought in across the years um is is really promising um certainly as a as a tutor so i, I tutor a lot of ssc groups and the first there has always been for um uh projects relating to inequalities and projects relating to lgbtq plus issues i've, I've certainly taught groups across the years that have just been really, really keen to just do something and be involved in something. Um, I was going to maybe go to Laura just to, from your perspectives as a student. Um, what's it felt like? You, you know, has there been stuff that's been actually dedicated to LGBTQ plus inequalities, or have you had to go and kind of seek it out yourself? Uh, and what would you want to see more of, if anything? Um, I sadly when we were in first year we didn't get our sort of day of lgbt learning i think it was due to strike action oh, yeah. and always sort of a promise that we would get it again we were really as a year group i think we were very keen to have it on over again and um, but obviously that's quite a big undertaking in itself so i've definitely gone out of my way to seek learning opportunities and to make learning opportunities um and one area there's a few like areas of medicine particularly like endocrinology I always bring it up we talk so much about sex and hormones I remember I did a mini teaching session for my PBL about the difference between sex and gender because everyone's so keen to learn but I'm, I'm just a loud mouth from Glasgow which is why I talk a lot about it lots of people don't have a loud mouth just to be like well actually this is what you should know so yeah I've I've had a very positive experience like going finding like my own people like all my own groups to talk to about it to teach me but yeah it definitely needs to be we shouldn't expect students to do that it's interesting you mentioned glasgow they i'm a guest tutor there on one of their sscs which is um looking at social determinants of health so it takes a, a wider picture and then each week there's a session on different areas and different elements one of which the one i teach on is the lgbtq plus kind of healthcare stuff um but that takes a very much a broader kind of step back and looks at social determinants of health and it looks at well how are these barriers created how do barriers get created to um equitable access and how are inequalities created um and actually it's something that people always get stuck with is is actually what is that what does inequality mean what does inequity mean um and uh, ben do you want to maybe come in and say well what is the difference between these what what are we talking about when we talk about inequity and inequality? Sure. I mean, I guess it is quite a hard thing to grasp when you're exploring it initially. And certainly these topics and issues are usually framed under the theme of equality and diversity, which is obviously, they're obviously two very important themes. Um, I guess I like to think of the difference between equality and equity. So equality puts everyone at the same start line. Um, but like you just said, Tom, you know, and, and like Debbie said previously, we can't just think about LGBT issues as, as their own problem. So equity really looks at getting everyone to the same finish line, um, because we know that just putting everyone at the same start line, you know, giving everyone the same access to services doesn't, doesn't lead to service uptake, doesn't lead to the same healthcare outcomes between different groups. Um, so I suppose that's the, the, the way that it makes most sense to me. So what, what we're, I guess, talking about today is how to achieve the outcome rather than you know how to get everyone started if that makes sense yeah it's 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 people just think that you know oh if we do this this and this 
then it's fine. If we tell if we tell people it's going to be okay and we wear a rainbow lanyard, it will be fine, and then everyone will be happy. But as you say, we still know that even when you do all of that, the outcomes are still not the same. And that's the key is, is actually how do we get to, to that yeah. point? One of the questions kind of submitted was actually about, well, how do we measure inequity? How do we know that we're improving? Um, which I think is a really interesting question. The, in healthcare, we are primed to want to research things. We're primed to want to show that we've made a difference to a thing, you know, which is the best treat from, treatment for this thing? What, what was the measurable outcome here? What was the measurable change here? And that's all well and good if you don't know what the change should be in the first bit, or if you don't know whether that change is going to make a difference and you want to measure whether a change has made a difference. And one of the things, so I, you know, I say this coming from the, from in, in the education director, we love QI projects. We love to measure whether something has made an improvement in some education and that kind of thing. But so much time is spent trying to find out the problem first so that we know what to change. Let, let's do some work to explore what the problem is first, and then we can decide what we're going to change. But actually there's so much research, there's so much stuff that we know already that we're not doing and we're not doing correctly. And we know that this is an issue, this is an issue, this is an issue. And so much of it gets repeated and repeated and repeated because people want to measure some change. People want to measure to make sure that something is improved. And actually we just don't do the stuff that we need to do, that we know we need to do. Um, and part of that is potentially that you can have all the will in the world and want to change stuff, but unless staff think that it's important and think that they should take this stuff seriously, and as Laura says, it's not just like the loud mouth from Glasgow um, trying to get everything changed, you know, um, or the or the the Glad member waving their kind of uh, flag, going, "Well, you know, Glad said this." Actually, unless the wider staff group care about it or think that it's important, then maybe stuff isn't going to change anyway. Um, Lorraine, I wonder kind of about your experiences as a staff member, um, whether that's been largely positive, largely negative. Have you seen things that have made good change or made good progress or is it largely negative? <laughs> um, I think it's interesting. I was just listening to <laughs> Debbie and Laura and I was thinking that there's two parts to it, isn't it? There's the, there's the kind of education and curriculum aspects and then there's the culture that exists within um, the medical school, but also within sort of healthcare within the NHS. And um, I think largely, and certainly in many sort of facets of medicine, it's still largely a heteronormative and cisgender culture. Um, and I think until that is challenged and we can start to create communities within medical education, within nursing education, um, that really actively challenge that, then as culture change, hopefully, you know, my hope would be that as, as that culture starts to change, then more equity is offered to patients coming through healthcare systems because there's better understanding, there's better um, recognition of the issues and more will to make things change. And I think that where that starts is with the conversations that thankfully that definitely were not happening in the first five or six years or that were not happening often or with any um, great concern in the first sort of five or six years, I would say that I worked in the medical school, but in the last couple of years and largely because of the, the, the voice of the students, I think, and not just the, the loud mouths from Glasgow. I'm also from Glasgow, so I can say that. But, um, you need the loud mouths from Glasgow, obviously. <laughs> a really active student body that are... Um, not just asking that things change, but are demanding that things change. And I, th I think that's what we've needed to see. And, you know, with staff on board, like like all of you guys, then then I think it is happening. So uh, I'm, I'm really encouraged by what I'm hearing and seeing. And we've actually had a question in the in the um, submitted page just now about nursing education and, um, and the kind of scope for that. And, and obviously I, I presume that uh, it is just as needing as uh, and lacking as medical education is as well? Um, so I, I do a little bit of, or I did a little bit of work with nursing students, um, but I don't actually know that much about how LGBT issues are supported in their curriculum. What I do know is that the culture of nursing and in medicine is very different. And I suspect that the issues are quite different. And, you know, from my own experience, clinically, the way sometimes 
that conversations are had around sexuality or around trans issues amongst nursing teams is almost more urgently in need of being addressed. Yeah. And I, I guess I think in medicine it's more subtle. I'm not saying it's not as important, but there are sometimes some quite basic issues that really need to be addressed through education. Um, and I was thinking about it before I came on here, just about some of the, the conversations that I've heard over the years. And it wasn't that long ago that in it wouldn't be too uncommon at a nurse's station to hear sort of giggling conversations about the trans person in bed such and such, um, or oh my god, I think that person's a lesbian, and and the way that that you know creates a, a, a homophobic culture makes it, it really hard for people. Yeah, absolutely, and. Um... I, well, I, we were going to cover this later, but actually that, that brings really nicely into actually how how do we address that in the work? You know, we still experience this in the work, but, you know, we still hear other members of staff using homophobic, biphobic, transphobic language um, or just or just, you know, even a more general thing of, of just not having that knowledge and awareness and um, sticking their foot in it um, and and you know, there's a lot to be said about how we address that and how we, um, you know, approach that in the workplace as as LGBT people ourselves, but also non-LGBT people as allies. And the best way to kind of address that um, in one of the in one of the sessions that I often teach, uh, the kind of talking point that, that um, we spend a lot of time on is just how bad the attitude of staff are. There was a um, there was a report by Stonewall um, in 2018, I think it was 2018, called the Healthcare Report. Uh, and that looked at healthcare staff across the UK, not just medical staff, not just nursing staff, but healthcare staff in, in general, any, anyone on sort of frontline healthcare. And it showed just the attitude um, of staff towards anything to do with LGBT issues, patients, colleagues, um, was, was pretty appalling. And, there is a lot of stuff we can do. Um, I wonder if um, maybe uh, either Ben and then Lorraine could wanted to sort of just talk about just your experiences clinically and, and as a member of staff and if you've kind of come across that kind of thing. And then I might go to Debbie to then talk about um, things like active bystander and, and some of the stuff that we might be able to do to address that. So Ben, do you want to talk about that for a bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I imagine I'm on an event like this, I'm probably preaching to the choir. Um, those in the audience that aren't, that don't identify as LGBTQ are obviously very keen to understand how to <laughs> tackle these issues. Um, but those of us that do identify as LGBTQ, I'm sure have experienced homophobia, whether that's directed at us or towards a patient um, that we've witnessed. And in the moment, I will hold my hands up and say, you know, it's very difficult to challenge it. it, it despite how often we might expect it, it throws you off guard there's always concerns about safety, our safety, patient safety. Um, so obviously a lot of this will hopefully change with active bystander and, um, you know, throughout the years if we're improving medical education. But I, just to briefly touch on a, a, a point that, that was just made about, um, which I think is relevant about how to engage staff that perhaps yeah. aren't interested in this or for all intents and purposes don't seem to care. I think there's two things that it's important for everyone to remember and that we should remind these staff perhaps, not necessarily in the moment, but afterwards, if there's a debrief, if there's a discussion, is that firstly, you know, we know that we have a wealth of information, we have a wealth of research showing that these attitudes are damaging to healthcare. And hopefully we've all gone into medicine, nursing, healthcare to help people. So at the end of the day, we should care about what, what will get them a good outcome, what will get them healthy what will improve their experience um, in the way that one would hope someone wouldn't be actively racist at work you can say well you know homophobia transphobia biphobia is damaging people aren't coming to hospital people are just self-discharging people aren't turning up to their appointments um, so appealing to that might work um, the other thing is that i think it's important to remind people sometimes is that actually within the nhs because the nhs is a public body there's legal protections for us and also for patients. So the Equality Act, the Human Rights Act, they exist and they're not perfect, but they exist um, and provide a legal framework both to protect us and patients and also challenge any discrimination. And actually that extends, it's what I think sometimes people don't realize or forget, as far as trusts actually have a, a duty to, to promote equality and equity. 
Um, so certainly if we raise issues with anyone, there is a legal and professional obligation of our employer, the NHS, to follow that through. So even in the moment, as we all know, it's very difficult sometimes to challenge it. If after the fact, people feel able to talk to, it might not be the patient, it might not be the member of staff that you've experienced the issue with, but someone, perhaps a senior clinician, um, they basically have to look into it. And the more that we talk about it, you know, the more that we raise it, the more we bang our fists, hopefully the more will be done to reduce this in the future. Absolutely, and, and, that's, and that's where, you know, as, as much as people like to, uh, you know, complain about things like Datex um, and, and other kind of uh, reporting systems, they do have a place for a lot of things. And this is the kind of thing where it very much is suitable um, as, a, as a reporting mechanism, certainly from a healthcare point of view uh, and from the, on the NHS, NHS side, because it, as you say, there is a, there's a legal responsibility. And once something has been submitted, it goes to the relevant people and they have to do something. And if they don't, they can be held accountable for that. Um, you know, we, we, we can touch a little bit later on things like the um, NHS rainbow badge and, and, and things around that, which if an organization has made an effort to show that it wants to be inclusive and provides uh, this kind of uh, commitment by doing things like having public events and having the rainbow badge and, and that kind of thing, then, and then when they don't, when, when they fail, when these things aren't investigated, when these things aren't actioned, it's a little bit more ammo for an individual to then be able to actually hold them accountable and say, well, actually, you know, we, there's no point in having this commitment if you're not going to then respond to this issue that I've raised. Um, and the same goes for the university. You know, the university have reporting systems as well. Um, then there's kind of independent ones like Speak Up. Um, and all of these things are methods of raising issues and unless issues are raised and unless people do actually um, kind of highlight when things have happened, nothing, nothing changes and nothing happens. But Ben, you, you're right. Like it's really hard in the moment to actually kind of do it yourself. Um, I wonder, um, and Debbie, if you want to talk a little bit about active bystander um, kind of things, because that is one method of um, either individuals or allies being able to actually address something that happens in the workplace. Absolutely. Um, I mean, this is something that we want to like make sure that our staff and students have the opportunity to sort of be trained, so to speak. But when we think of training, we often think of, oh, well, I'll go and do like an hour session or an afternoon session and then tick, that's me trained for the rest of my life. And I want you know us to make sure that yes, we're providing a training training session, but that that training session helps people to deal with real life examples and work through them with colleagues and with, you know, their students and for students with their teachers, their um, um, and medical staff. But the, the, the thing I think is really, really important in all of this is that we actually um, make sure that it's an ongoing thing. So, you will have hopefully what we're kind of thinking about at the moment is that students and staff will form a kind of um, active bystander buddy group where they'll meet up on a regular basis to discuss any problems that they're encountering or you know to discuss um problems that their colleagues have encountered so that we're this is ongoing work and it doesn't end at any point you know it's going to be something that they will continue to engage with. Um, and just making sure like this, you know, even though we're part of this, delivering this event, like watching this event happen is making me really happy because I'm just thinking, this is what we need to be doing more of. We need to be talking about these issues so much more. There's a lot of people that have come along to this event tonight, so there's definitely an appetite for it. So I think we really need to be making sure that there's more regular events on all these issues. And I was just I was just curious actually to ask Lorraine um, for if if a patient experienced some uh, you know homophobia biphobia transphobia as part of their care whilst they want a ward for example do you think that if they raised that with ward staff do you think in general that would be taken seriously or do you think that again there's, there's that lack of knowledge and lack of awareness of actually 
we have a duty to address this and yeah I was wondering um it's I don't know my connection's a little bit unstable can you hear me okay Good. um I was thinking about it before I came on here and and I think training but also allowing as part of that training you know what Debbie was just saying about ongoing training is so important but so much I think it's different for somebody like a medical student in a position of lack of power so with that power dynamic it's incredibly difficult to challenge like you were saying Tom but I was thinking about for myself I'm almost 40 and I still find myself in situations where I have that awkward moment of like oh shit they're beginning to talk about people's family situations I'm just going to go and do something else because they're about to say have you got a boyfriend and I find that quite shocking I'm like how does that it doesn't happen to me very often but it still does happen to me and I was thinking about why that is and my first thought is oh it must be something you know I'm just not okay with it it's you know it's my own issues but I don't think that's true it's because of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of little things that happen all the time over you know years and decades and a lot of the time we don't say anything because we are uncomfortable with the discomfort we don't want to create discomfort for the other people so the reason why I try as quickly as I can in a conversation to get it in that my partner is female and use the pronoun she is because I can't bear the other person's discomfort when they accidentally think I've got a husband or a boyfriend and I almost wonder if there's something in being able to learn to sit with discomfort so can I say this thing that makes everybody uncomfortable and notice the feeling around that and let it be um yeah. Because I think we're, you know, often it's it's about other people is, is what we're nervous of. And I was just thinking a medical student said to me not so long ago that they were told by a consultant in a hospital, I don't mind how camp you are, but you probably want to tone it down for such and such because it won't do you any favours. So, you know, we're not talking about, oh, in the 1990s, there was a really big issue. We're talking about still today, oh, regular absolutely really homophobic things said. And those big, terrible sort of, never should happen situations on top of all the little have you got a boyfriend on top of the little sideways comments create a culture where it feels a really difficult to challenge and be really difficult to be out sometimes you know um so Absolutely. in answer to your question yes yeah. yeah and that touches on uh, just that's that's a really um useful thing to kind of just bring up so um for if, if anyone wants any homework uh, for things to go and read about, um, I would encourage people to go and read about something called the minority stress model. Um, and it's it's essentially a, a framework for describing exactly what Lorraine is talking about there of that kind of um, years and years and years and years of little comments, little things, little things, and they all add up. And, um, you know, there's this concept of kind of, you know, everyone's armor. And I don't like to use the word resilience because it gets used incorrectly a lot and it's not exactly what i'm talking about but it's that idea of in of itself one comment is not necessarily a big thing but when it's again and again and again over and over again it chips away at everyone's armor and um the minority stress model is a really interesting thing to to read about um it doesn't just apply to lgbt people it applies to anyone who is a minority within the setting that they are in um and how the people in a minority have elevated um, stress responses and they have chronically elevated um, stress levels, which have a physiological, they're measurable um, from a physiological point of view. Um, and it's, it's it kind of describes why you see stats like, um, you know, the rates of depression, the rates of anxiety amongst LGBT people, even if they've never experienced a single form of actual discrimination um, that they could make label themselves, just, by virtue of having the perception that you might be discriminated against or that someone might say something. So as you say, Lorraine, just the perception that someone might ask you that question or that there might be that discomfort is enough to actually have an effect on you and actually kind of create that, that tension. And when that is built up again and again and again and again, that's when it starts to have significant effects on people. And Whenever, whenever you then go and read uh, any of this, you know, research, any reports, that kind of thing, having that understanding of that's the background context that people are coming from, it starts to make a lot of those stats and a lot of those kind of facts and figures make a little bit more sense. And you can kind of start to understand how um, it's not just that little thing. On the flip side, though, there are little things that we can do that make a massive difference. And one of them is just the day-to-day -day things like using the right language, using the right pronouns, 
um, asking people questions in the right way. Um, and it's one of the biggest things that we can do that seems really small, but it makes a huge difference. Um, I was wondering if Laura, you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about just inclusive language and pronoun use and just anything that might help that we can do um, that would make a big difference. And then others can then chip in kind of from experience as well. Yeah, that's great. Um, I suppose like Ben said, I, we're preaching to the choir here. So I, I know you're all very considerate, conscientious people. Um, so I'll probably talk about it in the sense of how I bring it up with different groups who aren't as, you know, conscientious of pronouns and, you know, LGBT friendly language. Um, and sometimes what I come across is people saying, oh, I don't understand it. I don't understand what it means to be non-binary. How can you not be one or the other, you know? And it is because we're in such a heteronormative world, people just they can't fathom it. And now personally, in medicine, I don't understand a lot of things. There's just lots of, I don't understand the kidneys. I just accept that they exist and there's things I have to do. As I don't a, think anyone does, Laura, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think they're real, really. Um, but yeah, so one thing I just, it doesn't matter if you understand it. The biggest thing you have to be is nice to a patient. Like, even if you walk, well, they walk away and they've, they've still got whatever problem they came with, to, with you, with them to you, if they walk away with a good interaction. And that's the same for all medicine, not just for LGBT people, but I feel like it's especially important. And um, it's, I always also like to say, it's okay to get it wrong. It's okay, like, you being uncomfortable because you've got it wrong is actually making the situation a million times worse. It's really like I get called the wrong name all the time. I get called my brother's name and my cat's name, but it's okay because you just you're like, oh, you're you're Laura. That we'll move on. It's kind of the same with pronouns. It's it's okay to to slip up as long as you apologise and move on. Don't make a big deal out of it. Um, but yeah, that's I was just. Also, always challenging people. I quite like to just drop it in. I wear a big pronoun badge on my lanyard just to see what people say. But again, I am like... Absolutely. But essentially it's role modeling, isn't it? It's, it's <laughs> showing that actually this is, when normalizing this, you know, a lot of people now have their pronouns in their email signatures and that kind of thing. I tried to have mine on my Zoom name and it didn't work. Um, and, and it is about that kind of role modeling and, um, I get this a lot in um, in pediatrics when we, you know, I talk about adolescent history taking and, and how to ask, um, you know, particular questions in uh, for adolescent patients. And, you, you know, the most common response that people ask, come up back with is, well, if you ask a boy if they've got a boyfriend, are they going to be offended? No, if it doesn't apply to them, it's going to go over their head. If you say, are you seeing, are you involved in, in, with anyone um, in a relationship? Are you seeing anyone, blah, blah, blah. Do you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend? Are you seeing it goes over their head if it's not applicable to them, but the people that it is applicable to will prick up their ears and it will make a big difference. And it, it's all it is about that. It's that it's that people think that people are going to take a massive amount of offense. And and if you ask them something that's not applicable to them, or why are you asking me my pronouns? They're not going to notice if it's not applicable or if it's not important to them. But the people that it is important to, it's a huge, it's a huge thing. Um, you know, the same goes for if, you know, we're then changing, um, changing details on, on the electronic healthcare records, right? Um, I don't know if, if anyone's had experience with that. I, ben or Lorraine, have you had experiences of, of that in practice of someone asking you? Ben's nodding. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's more general. Um, like Lorraine said before, you know, in a clinical environment, I'm sure loads of people watching can empathise in a clinical environment. It's not overt, necessarily overt transphobia. It's um, it's the small things. It's the it's the comments. It's the whispers. The you know the raised eyebrows when you mention the bay, the gender. Um, but to these patients, you know, we not to kind of harp on about statistics, but we know that like nearly half in a recent survey, nearly half of trans patients said that they they avoided seeking healthcare because they were worried about being misgendered. I mean, how easy is it? to then just like use the right pronoun like Laura said like literally like she said it's not it's nothing it's nothing to us it's maybe an awkward moment where we get it wrong and then you remember the next time so for patients it makes an enormous difference I've been in a situation where it wasn't a patient asking for their gender to be changed on their record because it was actually 
the correct gender for them, but it was a situation where they were being misgendered um, on a ward round. Um, and now that was probably unintentional, but the fact then that the first time it happened, no one corrected them was devastating because then everyone around just kind of assumed that that was, without being overtly transphobic, assumed that was the, the correct pronouns for this patient. So it is just as simple as sometimes asking the patient if you're not sure, that's not an offense in my experience from, you know, when I've dealt with trans patients, it's not, I, I've never been told that I've offended anyone by asking them what pronouns they wanted. And then just using those pronouns around other staff um, to reinforce their gender identity. And whilst Laura said it's a tiny thing to us, it's a huge, immeasurable impact for, for a large group of patients. Yeah. And a, a couple of the questions that were submitted with are things about actual well, how how do we ask that and, and do we ask it every single time and that kind of thing. And it's an interesting question. I guess the kind of step back from that a little bit is that this is a journey towards being better. And as a healthcare system, you know, we can't just jump straight to everything being completely perfect and, and easy for everyone. We all might, we have to go a little bit out of the way to actually show, yes, this is the stuff we have to, we are gonna ask people their friends, we are gonna ask people how they want to be referred to because that we have to do that to be able to get to a point where it becomes more natural. Um, and, you know, one of the criticisms, that kind of thing is that, that it's almost kind of positive discrimination that you're almost kind of um, going out of your way to, to, um, to try and make something better for a particular group. Like, well, yes, because as Ben said, we know that things are so awful that people do not present correctly to healthcare settings because of that people avoid accessing healthcare entirely because we can't use the right names for people. Um, it almost becomes a little bit easier in pediatrics, right? So we pretty much ask any child what they want to be called because often their name is given as a long name. You know, there'll be, there'll be Alexander and I'll go in and well, all right, well, what do you want me to call you? Because they probably want to be called Alex, right? But actually that just, I just now say that for everyone. I just say, my name's Tom. What would you like me to call you? Because their name could be anything. You know, it goes for names where um, it's a non-Christian naming convention where the first name written on the sticker or on the label is not necessarily that person's first name or the name that they are referred to by. So it becomes way more equitable to just apply the same rules to everyone and say, actually, I'm going to ask this person how they want to be referred to. Just a minor point on that is there was a period of time where people talked about preferred pronouns and preferred or like chosen names. Uh, particularly for trans and non-binary people, um, which is not necessarily the best way to do it because actually using the word preferred for things like pronouns um, and chosen for names kind of invalidates it a little bit because um, actually it's just, what are your pronouns? What is your name? How shall I refer to you? Um, and then just a little bit on just changing records. Um, ben, you, you, you might want to add to this from a legal perspective because I know you've got a background in law, but um, the uh, people get in a big tizzy, especially nursing staff getting in a big tizzy about changing healthcare records and, and uh, all that they presume that because it is track or the healthcare, electronic health record or that kind of thing, that there's probably some sort of whole big process around changing something on there, right? But there isn't. You can go, if a patient says, I would like you to record me as male, or I would like you to put this or this or this, you can go on there and you can change it in the same way that you can change a phone number. It is completely legal. It's their patient's right. And they do not need permission from anyone else. You don't need to phone records or you just go onto the help. Anyone can go on, change it on the computer, done. We do it in A&E all the time. We, we, we did it for a five-year-old last year. We did it for a 12-year-old last week. They said, I want this on my records. And you just go on and you change it. And it's, it, it literally is that simple um, from a healthcare record point of view. Um, I don't know if anyone has any experiences of patients asking them that or um, or any any challenges to that or anyone's come across any barriers trying to do something like that. I would say, I think sometimes, I don't know if Lorraine's had this experience or, or Debbie or Laura clinically, but the um, certainly from what you said, ward staff, you know, getting in a bit of a tears about, 
a patient's correct identity, where to put the patient. And I found myself getting a little bit frustrated in the past when there was a string of time when I felt like all the trans patients I'd looked after, the ones that I was aware of trans, because of course, actually the majority of the time, it's completely irrelevant to why someone's in hospital, um, were being put in side rooms because well, no one really knew what bay they should be in. And they were a little bit worried about upsetting others in the bay. And I think sometimes it's just worth reminding ourselves and the people we work with that it's very simple. Like Tom said, it's very easy to change if someone wants us to change it. Someone is identifying how they how they identify, whether that's male, female, non-binary. The latter gets a little bit more tricky in an outdated health service where you have male and female bays. But certainly for the first two, it's as simple as they go in a female bay, they go in a male bay. The other patients have absolutely no right to be aware that that person's trans. And actually the majority of healthcare staff don't need to know that patient's trans unless what they're in with is directly related to their gender identity. So I think it's very easy to get very het up about it. And this makes life very difficult for trans people when they access healthcare services. But actually it's very easy, like using the right pronouns, it's very easy for us to change things and to just remind ourselves and people around us that yeah. um, it's actually quite simple. Yeah. And Laura made a really good point about, you know, people make mistakes and it's okay to make a mistake and it's okay to get things wrong in earnest, as long as we have shown that we've tried and that we will then try and correct ourselves. So, you know, the, the complicated situation comes when, you know, if, if a patient is unconscious, so let's say a patient is, is um, you know, in some sort of accident, they brought in through a &E, they're unconscious, they go to theatre and they go to recovery. And the first time that they become conscious is after they are then on a ward. And, you know, this doesn't happen that often, but I've certainly had it as a question in teaching before where actually you don't necessarily have the opportunity to ask a patient exactly what, you know, what bay would you, you know, what kind of bay would you like to be on? And so often there is a trauma that is associated with that because an assumption is made and they're kind of shoved onto that bay tough and sometimes there isn't necessarily anything you do about that but it's about how that is then handled and about actually recognizing what it is easy if we then are open about it and are able to say uh, this is the situation where would be the best place where would you what you know how do you identify let's make sure that you're in the right place and that kind of thing and and doing our very best to be able to avoid that issue in the first place but mistakes are made, but it's, it's, if we do it from an educated point of view and from a perspective of trying, then it's at least a start. One really important thing just to, to say about pronouns and identities is that that's all very well and good for people who are out, um, but there is a gray area and a safety issue for people that aren't out or aren't out to everyone. So you can have a patient who uses certain pronouns and identifies in one way or another way of that kind of thing, who is happy for their, maybe their partner knows, or for you to refer to them as, let's say if someone identifies as male, uses the pronouns he, him, and they're happy for their healthcare team to use those pronouns, but their family don't know. So when it comes to visiting times, in the old days when visitors were allowed into hospitals, there's a safety element there that actually they might not be out to everyone. And that actually, if you're then, especially in, in you know, single gendered bays, you've then got someone who identifies as male on a male bay correctly, but then their family come to visit and they're not out. And then that, that creates a safety issue. So there is also that understanding of there's subtleties and there's safety concerns. And that actually, again, if we listen to our patients, we ask, ask them about this and actually show, okay, What's your name? What pronouns do you use? Are there any things that I need to know about when you don't want this used? And actually having that additional um, knowledge of that is really, really important. But going back to the absolute basics, as Ben says, we know that these simple things make a massive difference. There was a really good study recently that showed that using correct pronouns and name for trans and non-binary young people specifically uh, actively reduces suicide rates and suicide risk. So sim we, can, we can all engage in suicide prevention by just using the correct pronouns and using someone's name correctly. Like how cool is that? How cool is it to be able to actively reduce someone's suicide risk? 
by using the right name you know i also think part of the part of the conversation that it feels really important to me is that we're able to have difficult conversations as <laughs> communities like mm. this so everybody in, in this group and you know the some of the the issues that you were talking about there are actually really complex and and it's important that we're able to talk openly and what i'm observing is a sort of sense in society of people who maybe aren't as familiar with um trans issues or with using the right language there's a real sense of fear of people not wanting to get it wrong and not wanting to be accused of being transphobic um and I think it's, I just think it's so important that we're able to create safe spaces for everybody where you can have the difficult conversations. And, you know, one of the things I run a, a trauma-informed women's class for mostly for women who um, have experienced abuse by um, partners. And one of the really difficult conversations that we're having at the moment is how do we make that an inclusive space for all people who identify as female while also creating safety or a sense of safety. I don't think it's safety that's the issue, it's a sense of safety for everybody who's in that group. And I find it, it's maybe a little bit off topic, but it's quite a challenging conversation to have because even as I say it, I'm like, you know, I feel like, am I, am I being transphobic or, um, uh, you know, am I creating an issue? I think there's just some really hard conversations to be had and it's so important that we, that we can have them. And I guess that was what I wanted to say at that point. Yeah, and, and and you're right, and it, it's often, often always just comes back to education and, and being able to, you know, it's different to teaching someone about the kidneys, which is hard, but it's a hard topic, but it's different to having a difficult conversation. And unless we create, and this is where taking that step back is really important, unless we create environments where actually we can, people are open to being educated, it becomes really hard, you know, so, you know, we're talking about LGBT health, right? But actually there's, there's whole other areas that we're so far away from even beginning to make progress with. So for example, asexual identities and aromantic identities, which there's a lot of research that, you know, it shows that the, the, there's so many presumptions and assumptions and uh healthcare staff often med like medics like to medicalize things right so um and it's always reduced down to its absolute base um the kind of denominator of, of oh this must be a, a medical issue this must be a, an issue this and it's reduced down to sex or it's reduced down to just presumptions and inaccurate um uh assumptions and you know it's really hard to then make progress and change if we haven't created an environment where people are willing to learn and change and i guess that kind of comes to you know where do we start so i guess looping all the way back to undergraduate um undergraduate healthcare uh provision and, and and medical education you know how do we make these changes how do we look at curricula how do we make things so they're not just about men who have sex with men in the sexual health clinic and um uh you know reducing it to that kind of base assumptions of oh well there's your lgbt content. i studied in brighton and the only lgbt content we got was men who have sex with men have hiv <laughs> i went through some brighton um so yeah i, I mean debbie is a what kind of what kind of sense do you get from students and then law i guess jump in on this as well like what what do they want what can we what can we do to the curricula that can change things? Gosh, that's quite a different question. That's a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that we just need to approach this with such an open mind and with kindness and compassion. And I know how that might sound, but I mean it in, you know, the most you know, I, I mean that in a, a very non sort of spiritual way. <laughs> I mean it just that that's how we need to approach it. We need to think about, you know, like you said at one point during this conversation, Tom, you know, people who have gone into the healthcare professions have done so for a reason. Yeah. And they're, you know, they want to care for other people. And actually, we need to go right back to that and 
make sure that we do that in a very real way, thinking about the person that's in front of us and who they really are. In my experience as a patient, the best doctors are those who treat me like I'm a human being. <laughs> and those who ask me, like, you know, my name is obviously Debbie, but, you know, on my records, it's Deborah. And the doctors who tend to call me Deborah because that's what's on my records, I kind of know what kind of treatment I'm going to get from them. Absolutely. So, you know, I'm not a trans person, but I still like to be asked, you know, how I would like to be referred to. And I think that, you know, that is, is such an important part, uh, such an important way to approach yeah. healthcare. And I think that's really what our students want. But I'll let Laura um, elaborate a little bit more on that. Uh, yeah, I think I very much echo what uh, Debbie has said there about students just want we want a safe space to learn. That's true for every estate. Like, so no one wants anyone jumping down your throat when you get something wrong. And I think I'm very privileged. I, I grew up in a very liberal household where LGBT issues were like very white. Like me and my brother both came out before the age of 18. Like we were a very like, gay household. But not a lot of people haven't had that. And to come, coming to university is scary anyway, but to then come into this where you're just getting bombarded with information, I, yeah, compassion, taking, sp spreading it throughout our whole six years instead of very occasionally we have like something that we have to show up to and listen to and as soon as people walk out the door they forget it. Um, I think it's really important like repeat, repeating it and yeah, I think I suppose that'll come in with as medicine moves towards more holistic, like treatment of patients rather than just like body systems. But um, I can obviously speak from experience because we did body systems. <laughs> and, and some of it is, is recognizing that, you know, we, we also don't know everything and we're also, we are all learning ourselves. And, you know, even I take this panel, for example, you know, we are cisgender and we are white and that isn't good representation. You know, ad admittedly organized fairly last minute and, you know, cobbled together uh, and hopefully an interesting enough discussion. But I am very aware that we are trying to talk about intersectional things and we're all white. And, you know, a lot of the questions submitted are things about um, pronoun use, trans people, non-binary identities, and which we are speaking on behalf of. And that's not acceptable <laughs> and it's not appropriate. But, uh, you know, it's, we are in a, it, we're in a position where anything we can do that is helpful is helpful, but we need to recognize that actually, you know, we can always do better. And actually, should we have a trans person on this panel? Yes. Should we have someone who is white? Yes. Should, should actually we be elevating as many voices as possible? Yes. And we shouldn't be the gatekeepers of that either, you know. Um, it was last week, was, there was a wonderful um, trans health uh, session organized by the um, Glasgow uh, uh, University student group, um, which was absolutely amazing. Um, and again, anything that gives voices to people who should have that voice is important and recognizing that we um, don't always provide that and actually um, you know, don't always meet that is is important. Um, ben, I wonder if uh, just going back to um, yeah, education and resources and things like that. I know Glad have a load of um, kind of freely available resources. I'm a big fan of not repeating work that is already out there. So if we're creating content, actually, if it already exists, that's yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm very aware of times. I mean, I won't repeat, everyone has kind of answered the questions put, put forth very eloquently. Um, but if anyone wants to, you know, use any resources to improve curricula if they're involved in development or make any suggestions to people that might be involved in curriculum development, um, the GLAD website, which is www.glad.co.uk, has a lot of freely available resources. So there's guidelines on um, how to, like, everyone's discussed kind of integrate LGBT issues in a more circular way into a curriculum so it's not just pathologized um, how, and also guidance on how to integrate them into kind of postgraduate specialty specific curricula as well 
Um, and then this year also we're developing a program called Train the Trainer, um, which will be on again on the website hopefully in the next few months. So if people are in organizations that perhaps don't have this kind of all the stuff that we've been talking about available, the idea is that GLAD as an organization can, along with I think the LGBT Foundation and the BMA, can um, provide resources and training for clinicians or healthcare staff to then go and facilitate their own sessions in their in their home organizations as well. Um, so I would encourage people if, if they're interested in getting involved with teaching to have a look at that. I think one of the things we talked about a lot in the medical school was around about exam setting questions and teaching scenarios and you know why do we not have more I mean yeah gay people have asthma as well as HIV <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. and you know we, there was a little bit of pushback initially and it's they're trying it's, or well, the students might get off track or they might think that and it's like that's exactly what we need to change you know why, we yeah. really <laughs> that's the situation Exactly. Mark and his partner Ben are waiting in the room, you know, <laughs> um, exactly. and I think that's it's so simple to write an exam question in that way. Like it's so easy to make those changes, and I think that's that's what I hope we sort of move towards as one one aspect. I'm very aware of time, so we're going to stop in two and a half seconds. There's one more question which has got a really quick answer, which I which had been submitted, which I just want to answer very briefly because it's interesting. So, how do we ensure all healthcare related research is also open and open? So it's also open and inclusive to LGBT people. Uh, really good question. So um, this isn't talking about specifically LGBT related research. This is all healthcare research um, and the, you know, the idea of bias and selection bias and that kind of thing. Um, one of the issues about um, being underrepresented is that actually if stuff isn't accessible and isn't inclusive in the first place, then you are gonna get an underrepresented uh, sample in any kind of research. Um, one of the one of the really interesting things about the consent process is um, so I work with children um, uh, pediatrics and I've also worked in research clinical research for a number of years um, and in the consent process uh, if you are involving anyone in research if it is related to LGBT identities or um, or anything around minority uh, status then um, for young people there's uh, the actually the courts decided that you didn't need permission from their parents to be part of that research if it was around their identity, because if they weren't out, then they wouldn't be included in that research. Um, and uh, which is a really interesting kind of legal point. And then just in terms of general research, whenever we're designing studies, whenever we're designing research, having inclusivity and accessibility in built into the study design and built into the methodology from the start, and having good public patient involvement, which includes people from all different types of backgrounds and of all different types of identities, will ensure or hopefully ensure that your research is accessible and is inclusive rather than trying to fix it later on. Um, so I just wanted to answer that just because it's a very useful question. Anyway, there's we are out of time. Thank you for folk who uh, submitted questions beforehand um, and during. Um, there's a few other events coming up that are hosted by the Staff Network um, for the remainder of LGBT History Month. Um, so Wednesday this evening, there is a uh, LGBTQ plus trivia night from 6 to 7.30, um, and there will be a link sent out, I'm sure. And on Thursday, there is a session called Activism and the Future of HIV in Scotland uh, between 6 and 7.30 as well. Um, so try and attend both of those events if possible. I just want to say a massive thank you um, Firstly to uh, Jenny for organizing all of this um, and especially at such uh, short notice. And thank you massively to all the panelists. So Lorraine, Ben, Laura, and Debbie for all your contributions. Um, hopefully it's been interesting. Hopefully people have learned some stuff. Uh, I'm aware that there's only so much we can fill in an hour. Um, and hopefully we'll have more sessions like this in the future because I think we need it. Thank you very much, everyone.